Welcome everyone to another episode of Mortuary Gaming. On today's episode, we're looking into Obscure, one of the sixth generation's most overlooked and underrated horror gems, as well as the development studio that would go from making survival horror bangers to PSP shovelware in just six short years. I will be playing through every horror game released on the PlayStation 2 on this very channel, so if you're interested, please throw me a like and a sub. I've also got a Patreon and a Discord, as well as a second channel that focuses on Souls content where I do tier lists and rankings of bosses and whatnot. All of that you can find in the description of this video, but enough chuffa, let's get into the video. Is this yours? <laughs> Merry Christmas, Lizzie McGuire. Ah, the 2000s. What a time to be alive. Fallout Boy was rocking in boot cut jeans. Napster was breaking the music industry. Napster. Sharing's only fun when it's not your stuff. Our wrists were living strong and our jeans were riding low. Green Day had just invented punk rock with the 2004 release of American Idiot, causing middle school me to wear red ties over black short sleeve button ups to middle school because it's all I listened to for way longer than I'll ever admit. Zac Efron was panty raiding, Steven's rock show was untitled, and I was in front of my television every day free falling through the peak of culture. Meanwhile, in France, up and coming development studio Hydrovision was hard at work on their debut game Obscure, a survival horror game that aimed to closely follow genre conventions while also steering the vibe in a completely fresh direction for the genre, swerving away from stiff dialogue and dusty mansions and speeding ahead into a bright future of big pants and little shirts. In a 2005 interview with Die Hard Game Fan, Hydrovision delved a bit more into the game's inspirations. First of all, we loved teen horror flicks and slasher movies such as Scream, Buffy, and The Faculty, where we can see teenagers hunted, ripped, and decimated. We especially did not want to make a clone of what already exists. And this is exactly what I think makes Obscure such a uniquely refreshing experience. And I'm honestly shocked that there aren't more games like it, particularly in terms of fun teen horror. Sure, we eventually had plenty of those games in later generations, but I'm shocked the idea didn't saturate the market of horror games overall. We just ended up with more old buildings, great hair, and big ass boats. Where's the pizzazz? Where's the style? In Obscure, we've got big short pants, skinny short tops, fat skate shoes, energy drinks, old people banning energy drinks, v-necks over long sleeves, flip phones that lose service at the worst possible time, archetypal characters that say stuff like, yeah, everything I see up in this piece is whack. And that's not even to mention the soundtrack. Obscure has it all, and this is maybe the most honest representation of 2000s slop I've ever seen in a game. Obscure also has one of the most unique and entrancing scores I've ever heard in a horror game, thanks to the incredible talent of brand new composer I'm probably going to get his name wrong, Olivier Derevery. De 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 I should probably just look it up. Okay, we got an interview, let's see. Bonjour. I'm Olivier de Rivière. That was so fast! Okay, let's try half speed. Let's see if that helps. I'm Olivier de Rivière. That did not help. Okay, regardless of how to say his name, Obscure was the first game he'd ever worked on. He'd go on to score such games as Remember Me, Life is Strange, Vampire, The Plague Tale series, Greedfall, Streets of Rage 4, Dying Light 2, and that's just to name a few. His potential to go on to an impressive career is very apparent in Obscure, however. In an interview with DBS Institute in 2019, he expanded on how we got involved with Hydrovision. I've been participating in meetings called coding parties since I was a teenager. There, we would spend three days without sleeping to create a demo that would show off the capacities of each team. You could consider that game jams are quite similar nowadays. Over there, I met with coders, artists, and more that later on became part of the game industry. That's how I started making connections, but in fact, working on Obscure was very random. Although I didn't know anybody at Hydrovision Entertainment, I knew so much more about the technical aspects thanks to my years with my friends that it made my hiring much easier. Now, what makes the music in Obscure so especially interesting is the bold, unique approach that instead of haunting strings or dark ambience like we would expect for a title like this, instead incorporates tons of colorful vocal passages and pieces that feel less like atmospheric drones and more like a collection of individual songs. I found myself constantly being aware of the game's music while I played through it, which is something that I can't say for a lot of games. 
However magical as the aforementioned things are, they're not all that makes this game special. While maintaining myriad traditional survival horror mechanics and structure with incredible music, the game also employed multiplayer functionality that, while playing solo, allows you to switch between members of your friend group. Later in the same game fan interview, Hydrovision expanded on this, saying, In Obscure, you manage a group of five students you can play with and make them survive all along the adventure with more or less losses. Each one has his own nature, background, and specialty. A thug can lockpick, a quarterback runs faster, there's the clever one, the little sexy nurse, and the cheerleader chief is a gunfight pro. All right, that's quite enough, Frenchie. You had me at cheerleader chief gunfight pro. So am I still waiting for this world to stop hating? Can't find a good reason. Can't find hope to believe in. Wow. <laughs> The intro sequence of this game is one of the more notable parts of it, with Sum 41 still waiting, rocking over sweeping shots of the school and introducing its characters. Sadly, I couldn't play that here due to copyright issues, but as a lifelong fan of the Sums, it's important to me that y'all can get that experience as it was intended, so if my shoddy recreation wasn't enough for ya, I've linked the original intro into the bio. The game opens with Kenny, a jock baller baddie, shooting hoops in the gym before being lured into the school's seedy underbelly, where he stumbles onto some lab equipment, human-sized cages, and a ghoulish classmate who has very obviously been down here for quite some time. They attempt to escape together but ultimately get trapped, serving as the catalyst for the rest of the story. This section doubles as our tutorial where we learn how to tape flashlights onto our guns, which will become incredibly important later. We learn how to swap between characters when we're playing solo and just overall get a feel for things, which all feel great. The movement speed is perfect, the controls quickly become second nature, and most importantly, the camera is tremendous. I didn't think about the camera a single time while playing through the game, which as you may know, is more or less the goal when it comes to a great game camera. Eventually, a few of the students notice Kenny's missing and decide to stick around after school to find him, which causes them to become accidentally locked inside. We've got Josh, whose attributes probably are the most helpful of the group, as when you press square while playing as Josh, he'll tell you if there's any other items left in the room that you've yet to find. There's nothing left for us here. Which is extremely helpful in a survival horror game. We've also got Shannon, the character previously described by the developers as the sexy little nurse, who technically has two special attributes. She's got a passive skill of healing 20% more effectively than the other characters, but her real gift is to remind the player what the next objective is whenever prompted, which, while in a game that's pretty straightforward all things considered, is still a big help after a short break from the game or just forgetting what you're supposed to be doing. I've seen this hand wheel somewhere before. I'm certain it was in the office building. Ashley, also known as the cheerleader chief gunfight pro, is the resident badass of the group whose special skill is rapid firing pistols, causing more damage to enemies and overall just being a girl boss. If you don't stop, I'll kick your ass. God, I love the PlayStation 2. She's also got low-rise jeans and a whale tail because this game comes from a much better time. Eventually, the team breaks loose from the cafeteria and after a short bit of exploration, we run into Professor Walden, a biology teacher who shows us the monsters can be defeated with light, particularly sunlight by triumphantly breaking windows and bathing the beasts in UV rays. And this is where the combat of the game really starts to take hold. Combat's a huge part of Obscure and things here feel pretty great as well. There's a short little gun tutorial in the game that teaches you how to switch targets by having you shoot various pictures of your classmates, which is really something. But overall, I think Obscure probably has some of the best feeling combat in the sixth generation horror game. Obscure has three difficulty modes, but they don't really change much beside ammo and item drops being more or less in number. They do, however, allow you to unlock different things depending on the difficulty you finish the game on, including a sexy go-go dancer, fishnets, and neon hair getup for Shannon you can unlock by keeping her alive to the end of the game, which is worth keeping her alive in and of itself. Honestly though, regarding difficulty, you can kind of set your own difficulty based on the team of characters you choose to run with. And while no one character is necessarily so useful or so inept that they can fundamentally 
actually alter the difficulty of the game, they can absolutely give you a leg up in certain scenarios, which I think is really the best way to do something like this. I was worried when I started the game that it would end up as either a tactical squad-based game like The Thing, or on the other side of things, a series of pain-in-the-ass escort missions, but it manages to be neither of those and instead ends up finding a solid, relatively balanced compromise of the two. Most of the time, the NPC you have with you can handle most combat situations, and while it does take a bit of tinkering with to get it right, once you figure out how the NPC reacts when you do certain things, such as stop moving when you stop moving, back up when you back up, when I move, you move. Just like that. it adds a surprisingly fun gameplay dynamic where you have to kind of encounter enemies as a unit and keep their placement in mind when fighting the enemies. Now, the downside to this system is that while they aren't completely helpless, they do seem to die rather quickly if you're not careful. Most of the time when I had to reboot my save, it was because the NPC died and not because I died. Shortly after finding Walden, we run into Stan, my personal favorite obscure character. Stan is our dopey stoner rebel archetype who specializes in picking locks and making bongs out of two liters. <laughs> Are you okay? I'm fine. How about you? I don't know yet. We find him in what appears to be the teacher's lounge, retroactively editing his notes for a better grade. He offers to do the same for us for 50 bucks, which in today's money is roughly 80 bucks, which for cheating a paper is way overpriced, so we politely turn down the offer. His special attribute is sadly the weakest, as he can pick locks faster than everybody else. I got this. I can pick this thing. But every character can pick locks, and he never really adds much of value. However, he does have probably the best drip in the game, and we've got to appreciate that. Stunting a v-neck over a long sleeve, denim baggy shant, and puffy skate shoes, Stan is unfuckable with Lee Cool. He listens to a lot of Eminem, drinks a stunning amount of Fago, and definitely just stole your lighter. The gameplay loop from here becomes your typical survival horror fare. Unlocking doors and shortcuts, killing loads of wonderfully hideous enemies, and working together with your friends to uncover the greater mystery behind the horrors of Leafmore High. While you can only control two characters at once, the remaining part of your team just sits around at the meeting point, where everyone just sits around doing f all and giving you shit when you come back. You're finally back. You know, I almost missed you guys. Stand up! Around the middle point of the game, I started worrying that I wasn't getting quite the full experience because I was just playing with Josh and Ashley, so I figured it'd be smarter to try playing with some of the other characters to see if that would spice things up a bit. Well, Ashley died immediately, so that's not good. I'll back up to a previous save, but first I want to see if the others get distressed. Take a sip of that monster, big guy. This is going to be a hard talk. <sighs> All right, man, we got this. Just, just tell him what happened. It's, it wasn't, it wasn't me, man. Let's just, let's just let him know. It's not a big deal. <sighs> hey, man. Uh, hey, I gotta talk to you. Let's move. Yeah, no, about that. Uh, Ashley, Ashley got killed, man. I, I. I let's move. Yeah. Uh, okay, I'll no, you just let me, let me talk, let me tell Shannon. All right, I'll go. No. With you. You don't- Why won't anybody listen to me? Why won't you listen to me, dude? Ashley's fucking dead! Wow. No one cares. Poor thing, she didn't deserve that. What the fuck, dude? Her body is gone and it just leaves her belongings. I'll just keep her dead for science to see if it affects the ending at all, but I'll try not to let anyone else die. Enemy design is pretty unique, and there's a couple boss fights that really took me by surprise. Look at this little guy. Oh my god, he's so cute. You can really see the connection to the student that was transformed here. The eyes and the hair and the way he blocks his face just makes you feel kind of guilty for shooting him. It's a really neat touch. The puzzles aren't bad either. I especially like this puzzle where you have to block the elevator doors to be able to raise the elevator, but then you have to come back down the ladder to descend into the elevator shaft, but make sure that you lock the safety above so that it doesn't fall below you. Oh shit, I forgot the safety stand, no! Oh, shit. What's up, Josh? Well, this is awkward. Eventually, after running back into Kenny and finding out he's still alive, we get imprisoned by Dr. Friedman. It's okay, though, because he left us a giant stick with a hook on the end and some bolt cutters nearby, so we were able to make it out okay. The final boss of the game, I shit you not, is a bed of chaos progenitor that is astoundingly fun to fight. 
It's a neat fight, really, that gives you safe places to heal with plenty of time to heal both players when solo, and you just circle around and shoot the limbs to bring in a collapse of the upper story and bring forth the light to finish them off. Well, sort of. There's a second phase that I did not expect and really took me off guard. Uh, Shannon! <laughs> Upon beating the game, you get new outfits for whatever characters made it to the end, a dope little behind-the-scenes mini-documentary, and two music videos. One for Sum 41 still waiting. What's in now is the... Okay? Yeah. The strokes, the I can't see you, the vines, the hives, the white stripes, the Led Zeppelins, right? Are you feeling me? And one for Span, a band that seems to have disappeared not long after this and never really quite hit it as big as Sum 41. Speaking of bands, this episode is brought to you by me. My death metal band, Alistair Cowboy, just released a new single called Huffing Necrotic Filth. So if y'all are into death metal, check the link in the bio to catch us on all streaming platforms. Our second EP, Chambers of Anguish, will be out March 22nd, and we're all very proud of it. Obscure was released on October 1st, 2004 in Europe and April 6, 2005 in North America on PS2, PC, and Xbox, two middling to slightly above average reviews with a Metacritic score of 65. IGN had one of the higher reviews for the game, giving it a 7.6 and saying, Obscure is still dissimilar enough from other horror favorites like Resident Evil and Silent Hill to warrant a pickup by diehard genre fans. And besides, the co-op mode is almost worth the price of admission alone, while the hidden bonuses you receive for beating the game add even more to its overall value. Just don't expect anything too enthralling when it comes to plot advancement or puzzle solving. PlayStation Magazine had a particularly scathing review of the game, on the other hand, giving it a 2 out of 5 and saying, Obscure is a cut-rate survival horror game set in a high school. Maneuvering and combat are both very clumsy, and the whole game leaves you wondering about the choice the game designers made. The group of students you control is no brain trust. Even Scooby-Doo and the gang could have figured out what nefarious plot was afoot after exploring the first building. But not only can these kids not figure it out on their own, they actually stick around a campus filled with murderous creatures when nothing is keeping them there. Be smarter than they are and stay away. Then, somehow, for some insane reason, the writer, Dana Jagaward, compares it to Doom, calling Obscure better than Doom. Who wrote this, George Wood? Just get over it. This is the age of South Park. We don't like South Park, but we do like Resident Evil 2. The game did score itself a sequel, much to the chagrin of Donna Jagaward, which was released on PSP, PS2, Xbox, PC, and the Wii in 2008, with many of the same crew rearing development. We're going to get into the sequel more in depth on another video down the road, but suffice it to say I've played about an hour of it, and I really, really, really hated it. So stay tuned for that sometime later this year. I'm kind of flummoxed by it. Hydrovision also developed the 2008 Alone in the Dark, then they began a very odd spiral into a bunch of weird PSP and PS3 mobile style games. It's really weird, check this out. So they made Obscure 1 and 2, Alone in the Dark, then immediately switched lanes with a non-horror title, Fairy Tale Fights, a hack and slash for the 360 and PS3, which scored a mighty 51 on Metacritic and is mainly remembered as bargain bin garbage. But this is where things only begin going off the rails, because after Fairy Tale Fights, they made Team Elimination Games, a Wii party compilation, then they just fall completely off the reservation and start making arcade compilation games like Best of Board Games and Best of Arcade Game compilations, along with various other cheap garbage games such as Aladdin Magic Racer for the Wii and Idiot Squad for the PSP. Some of the other titles from this era include Tetrominoes, Brick Breaker, Solitaire, Funky Lab Rat, Dungeon Twister. Like, what the f*** is this? How did this company, and even the same lead programmers and technical directors who worked on Obscure, end up making shovelware bargain bin slop? I couldn't leave well enough alone, and I booted up a few of them just out of curiosity. I mean, I loved Obscure, and it's a game steeping with artistic merit, so maybe I'm wrong and the other games they made were more than meets the eye. So let's get started. The game I booted up first was Funky Rat, a PlayStation 3 move game in which you complete platforming puzzles with the goal of collecting pills? Is that what makes him funky? 
Truly a game from another time, but not that different a time. I'm definitely surprised this was passed along even 14 years ago. Turns out, things used to be quite different for the game. Actually, I found an old interview with Hydrovision in 2010 where they said, the little story behind the game title is that the first name was Junkie Lab Rat because Diego is collecting pills throughout the levels. Wow, I can't imagine why that didn't go over well. Too bad they changed it. I can already imagine a gameplay scenario where if you don't get enough pills, everything becomes an upside down water level because Junkie Rat gets dope sick. But I will say, this honestly does give me a little bit of respect for the company because that is at least an irreverent idea that has more integrity than just making a dumb kids game. So I guess we can give Funky Junkie Lab Rat a pass for now. The team also also reportedly had a fair bit of fun making it, so that's good at least. But what came next? Another puzzle game? Another horror game, perhaps? Maybe even another irreverent 2D puzzler? Nope, just bullshit keeping people busy games with nothing of value or interest to speak of in the least. It would appear this was the era in which Hydrovision was just making games for whoever would keep them afloat, in this case, publisher Big Ben Interactive, unknown for releasing such games as Bee Simulator, multiple Brick Breaker games, the Kakuto series, Cycling Manager 2, Truck Racing Championship, Dolphin Trainer, just garbage games made exclusively for people to stare at drunk at Walmart at 3 a.m. to wonder who buys this shit. Then, somewhere in the early 2010s, the company silently dissolved with Hydrovision CEO Francois Potentier reportedly bringing over select staff members to his new gaming company called Mighty Rocket Studios. Not to be confused with Wooden Rocket Studios who make much more interesting content. Mighty Rocket Studios seems to boast just one game in its catalog, that game being the 2D side-scrolling hack and slash final exam which was previously known as Obscure 3 Final Exam, but it had to change the name because it was so incredibly different from the first two games, the negative response forced them to rename the game. In fact, the game was renamed three times. It was originally called Obscure 2013, then it was remade all over to become Obscure the Final Exam, and then the final name has remained Final Exam. Now, I spent a whole five clams on this game, and I'll be totally honest here, I actually more or less enjoyed my time with it. Maybe it was because I went in with my expectations unfathomably low, or because I just sucked down a barrel of pills, but I thought this game was actually pretty good. Sure, I understand them removing the obscure branding, as it is about as far from the original games as something could possibly be, but I think as far as a spiritual sequel goes, it's a totally serviceable 2D beat-em-up, and the things it does share in common with obscure, like the cartoonish college-aged character aesthetics, monster designs, and multiplayer functionality, are all pulled off reasonably well, all things considered. Sadly, however, Mighty Rocket seems to have closed shortly after, and company founder and CEO Francois Pontentier seems to have become a marketing agent at Epsilon. Wow, what a guy. Which kind of makes sense because when you look at their catalog, even including Obscure and Alone in the Dark, this is a company who was clearly always following the money. They were honing in on a trend of 2000s culture. They were cashing in on the survival horror trend. They were just clearly just kind of following the money. So I guess we shouldn't be surprised that when they fell off, they just kept following the money and making games for whoever they could. It's just such a bummer that they couldn't have moved forward in a path that was more interesting or more artistically sound. However, at the very least, I do have to give Hydrovision credit because they were a studio that at least one time had some kind of vision that was interesting and a passion for making games that likely due to poor sales and reception had to sell their souls to keep their jobs, pimping themselves out to any publisher who would have them. Oh, how times they aren't a changing. All right, y'all, that's it for me this week. Thank you so much as always for checking out what I'm doing on this channel. I also have a Patreon where I do exclusive live streams and other such fun shit, as well as a second channel in which I occasionally post really long rambly souls content. So if any of that sounds good to you, check it out. Otherwise, please like and subscribe and I'll smell you later.